But here it is, the pan-corona vaccine, China and Russia, I mean, China and Cuba working together. This is incredible. This is incredible news. All right, tell us, or a little too much with that. So Cuba managed to develop five COVID-19 vaccines that inoculated 95% of its population against COVID-19, despite the burn of the U.S. blockade. China has produced a massive amount of two different vaccines for 1.4 billion strong of its population in much of the third world. So it says Cuba and Chi- in China, Cuba and the People's Republic of China, jointly filed the first patent for a vaccine against COVID-19 and its many variants, which could also be effective against several related viruses. The Cuban Daily Grandma told reported on Thursday. So the patent was presented at the National Intellectual Property Office in China recently, according to Eduardo Martinez Diaz, a president of the state-owned BioCuba Pharma Business Group. The vaccine is a product of a collaboration between the biotechnological sectors of the two socialist states. Doctors from the Cuban Ministry of Public Health announced the endeavor in a March 2021 editorial published in the, by the Brita, British Medical Association journal, the BMJ, noting that it would be based at a facility in Yangzhou, Hunan province. The letter said the project arose following a Chinese request, although according to Grandma, work at Yangzhou on a vaccine for the coronavirus family of viruses, which includes SARS, MERS, and the common cold, as well as COVID-19, began in 2019. So there you have it. You have a, they're working on a pan-corona vi- uh, a pan-corona virus vaccine, which would be huge. I mean, how many lives could you save? I mean, these these two sec- these two countries have massive biotech sectors, very impressive healthcare institutions, public health institutions. How impressive would it be if they rolled out a pan coronavirus that would address COVID-19, SARS, MERS, and the common cold? How many people would you save? How many lives could you save with that? It would be an incredible feat. We got to look out for that. That's very good news. So it's something to be proud of. That's socialist solidarity. Uh, uh, that is how you address this vaccine question by producing real results, real collaboration, getting the work done. I want to share one other thing with you. This was from Bloomberg. I, I posted it last night. But now there is um, interesting developments here. Did I, did I bring it up? Oh, no. Did I not bring it up yet? Okay. I thought I did. Here it is. Here it is. China reduced air pollution in seven years as much as the U.S. did in three decades. So, there. I mean, that's that the headline alone should tell you what's going down here. All right? What's going down is that China, and I was there. It's incredible the progress they've made. People in Beijing were telling us, that they remember when they in the 90s, even in the early 2000s, the smog was incredibly difficult. It felt like it was hard to breathe. It did cause health problems. People paid for the rapid pace of industrialization. That was a sacrifice. That was about increasing the means, uh, the productive forces, and it did have consequences. But now, what you've seen is China has addressed this by reducing air pollution more in seven years than the U.S. did in 30. The amount of harmful particulates in the air in China fell 40% from 2013 to 2020, according to the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute, which would add about two years of average life expectancy if sustained. While smog and large swaths of the country still significantly exceed safe levels, its experience shows how quickly progress can be made. Researchers, including Professor Michael Greenstone, said in a report published Tuesday, here's the graph. Here's uh, uh, China slashing air pollution, right? Especially beginning, you see here, what was that? Probably 2013, 2014, 15. You see the dip all the way into 2020. You see the rest of South Asia, the pace of industrialization is growing, but yet the pace of their mitigation measures, their environmental measures is not. So it's really holding steady. And look at the rest of the world, just stagnant, right? Look how stagnant that is. So in terms of curbing, uh, uh, pollution. So China's made such great strides in this area. And um, that's really good news. Even in the US and Europe, which have been battling pollution for decades and account for just 4.1% of global health bur- burden from airborne particulates, more than 90% of people live in areas that don't meet the WHO's guidelines, which were tightened last year. China's success, led by restrictions on car use and coal burning in major cities, 
has been rapid with 40 it's 40 percent decline in seven years nearly equaling a 44 percent drop in u.s pollution over 30 years from in the u.s from 1970 after the landmark clean air act was passed the researchers said by email so they say that beijing remains three times more polluted than los angeles the smoggiest city that's interesting and the national average for air particulates is six times higher than recommended that's interesting i would love to see that you know, I think that's going to rapidly change and already is. When I was there, it didn't feel like that. But of course, I was only there for a week in Beijing. Um, but the life expectancy is going to go up by years in China. It's already surpassed Beijing, for example, already has a higher life expectancy than people in New York City. So China's life expectancy is going to surpass the United States. And this is just one way it's going to do so. So I just want to share that with you. So these are just instances of good news, right? And then again, I shared on Twitter, I shared with all of you that the United States uh, it now has been surpassed in terms of perceptions of young African people. So young African people across the continent now favor China. And why would, why would that be, would you think? Why would they favor China? Why would they say China is a country that they look up to more. Well, it's because the relationship is becoming a lot more, oh, sorry about that, a lot more robust. And so this is Kishi, um, uh, Kishi, and it is the, uh, you should read this. I mean, of course, it's the Communist Party bi-monthly journal, but they come out with good stuff. Sometimes it's just the state media kind of being republished like this, Xinhua. But on February 24th, they said Chinese built Ethiopia Djibouti Railway, boosts regional integration. And so it's talking about, this was from February, I believe. Yep, February of this year. Talking about how the standard gauge railway from Addis Ababa to Djibouti has won a claim and how it's really part of a flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's Africa's first fully electrified transboundary railway that contributes to regional integration. And that if you look at who, let me just make this bigger, who built this, okay? It is state-owned corporations, the China Rail Engineering Corporation, China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation, and of course, the Ethiopian government. That's who financed this, 70% China, 30% Ethiopia. And... It has reduced the freight time, the freight transport of goods, the transportation time for more than three days to less than 20 hours and reduced that cost by at least a third. So, I mean, for economies as poor as Djibouti, as poor as Ethiopia, I mean, this is huge. So Ethiopia is landlocked, which means that it can't, re it can't send out goods by sea without using Djibouti's port. So significantly reducing that time is huge. The monthly transport revenue exceeded 9 million and 10 million US dollars in October and November of 2021, the best result since 2018. Revenue is 37.4% higher now than in 2020. It has 4,000 jobs have been created by this one railway, accounting for over 90% of the total staff is Ethiopian, Ethiopian workers. So it's it's part of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is what the Belt and Road Initiative is. It's about building this kind of infrastructure. Here you have pictures, some pictures of uh, Ethiopian and Chinese uh, diplomats, ambassadors coming together, representatives talking about this. But I wanted to show you that because I think it's important to see that why young Africans would look at China with a more positive lens than the United States. Now, it's not to say the young Africans don't look at the United States with a positive eye. I think the numbers were something like 79 and 71% respectively, but it's been a rapid change, right? It used to be that the United States, because of cultural imperialism, because of the US's deep influence on Western media, Western press, the Westernization of Africa, of Africa, um, it used to be that the United States was looked upon as like the American dream, the center of the world, right? Everyone wanted to go, you know, that sort of thing. But now African students are choosing China too for education by far. Now that's not even a question. So that's why the changes happened because there are more opportunities. 
more jobs, more capacity to develop the country, reliable friendships, that sort of thing. So this is great. These are just good news. There's good news out there, guys. It's not all bad. 